Hello there, everybody! It's Silk Butter Nine Dragon Armor, and welcome back to the House in Fata Morgana. Now, then, in the last episode, we discovered the identity of the beast and learned quite a little bit about. Uh, what would be the word? How complex a character Yugi Masa is? Well. Hmm. Yeah, that ended all happy. Jesus Christ, that was fucked up. Oh, but man, that was such a good twist, though. Ugh, that was that was executed just perfectly, honestly, and, my, and that's my opinion. Ugh, I freaking love this novel, so let's... No, I don't want to lock it. Let's jump right back in to... The Fruit? Okay. His psyche drifted radically between human and beast. If he accepted himself as human, it might cause memories better left barely to return to him. If he accepted himself as a beast in exchange for his memories, he would no longer be able to rejoin human society. The white-haired girl fervently supported him in these precarious times. I was quite amazed. I had never imagined she would grow to be such a strong woman. Nevertheless, God is a cruel master. For what strength he gave her spiritually, he took an equal part from her physically. Though she persisted day in and day out to stay by the man's side, one day, she suddenly fell ill. With her in the throes of a high fever, not knowing the cause, he fell into perpetual panic. There was no medicine in the mansion. They could hardly manage to put together sufficiently nutritious meals. Though there was no medicine, maybe there was something else that could make her feel better. However, everything you could think of required him to leave the house. Oh wow, I thought we were done here, but I guess not. Hey. Hey. Is... is there anything you would like? Anything I would like? I'm... considering... visiting the village. I see. You're going to the village. I thought I might be able to get some medicine. I would prefer to bring a doctor here. But no one would come if they learned you were in this mansion. So, He was planning to put on the disguise to enter the village as a person. The white-haired girl smiled when she heard his idea. She had, after all, always wanted him to think of himself as human. However, because she was so pure-hearted, she did not comprehend the full extent of the slaughter he had confessed to committing. The revenge he had taken on those who had chased him around. How sinister his cackling and furious his reaping. She did not grasp just how serious it was. As she had faced, that bestia had kindness in his heart. If you cannot get any medication, then buy me some oranges, please. Oranges? This is a land blessed by the sun. You should be able to find some wonderful fresh oranges. Will that make you feel better? Yes, it should. Okay. Bestia's mind was made up. He would don the skin of a human for her to protect the peace he had. He would return to the place that had left him with many painful memories. It was to him the source of his fear. Whenever he let his guard down, their shouts would play back in his mind. <laughs> bestia! 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 Hideous beast! Though he had physically conquered the people who lived there, Bestia's memories of the village still haunted him. But her health meant more to him than any of them. He was willing to cast aside his fear if it meant the white-haired girl would recover. The girl still in her bed, he made his way out of the mansion. Damn. He crossed the overgrown forest, pushing forward one step at a time, all the while trying to brush aside his apprehension. I thought we were going to be done with the store, but I guess we're still going. Until he arrived at the village. This is where... They called me a beast, where I was almost killed, and where I killed them. I look different than I did then. I'm dressed differently too, but can I play the part? Can I act a convincing enough human? I have no choice. There are no other villages. villages. I can't let her die. Excuse me, could you answer a question for me? 
the village man is looking at me. Only for a moment. But for me, that moment is torturously long. A faint look of panic crosses his face, perhaps in fear of my appearance. He's staring at me. Will he point his finger and call me a beast? Will the other villagers come to kill me? However... I haven't seen you around here before. He didn't recognize me. Yes. I... yes. I come from a faraway land. And um, I am unfamiliar with this area, so... <laughs> You're dressed like a nobleman. On a secret trip or something? It's something like that. You look rather pale, though. Searching for a doctor? Ah, yes. But not for me. Um, my companion has come down with a fever. Sorry to hear it. Well, I'd love to introduce you, but he's out right now. And he won't be back for a few days. I... I see. And where might I be able to buy fruit? There's a shop just around the corner. Thank you very much. Eh, don't mention it. Do take care, Traveler. It's dangerous out there. Huh. I'm starting to attract attention. But... Not the same kind as before. They don't look at me with revulsion, hatred, or furious indignation. They're simply... Curious. The village feels different than last time. Could, could, it, could, it, could it have changed this drastically? Or is it because I really did look like a beast then? And now I look like a human? I don't know. Excuse me. Me? Yes? I would like to buy some fruit. Uh, some oranges. Oranges? Alrighty, here's a sec. The fruit vendor doesn't recognize me as the beaster, either. Any other year, and they'd be a lot plumper than this. But this year, we've had the end of the war and this whole mess with the beast, and it's just been crazy. If you'd like, how about you come back in a few years and try our oranges again? Uh, they'll be several times better, I assure you. I'll keep that in mind. You bet, that'll be... I'm sorry. I don't have any local currency. Uh, would this suffice? What? How is... Uh, no good, I take it? No, 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 no! On the contrary, it's hardly fair for you trading a jewel for a few oranges. Uh, that's all I have to offer. I, I hope you can exchange it for money. T sure. Uh, you nobles are something else. N no. Aren't you? Uh, though if you wander around dressed too well, you put yourself in danger. You might find yourself stripped bare by a bandit or even perhaps catch the attention of the beast. The beast. Everyone mentions the beast. Uh, they speak of me. Have you heard of the tales? I... I have not. There's a beast's den not too far from this village. It's attacked before and we've been living in fear, never knowing when it might attack again. Uh, but that all ends today. Hmm? The men have finally found their spines! They all got together and went out to exterminate it! Wh what And <laughs> you'll never guess who's responsible! A kid! A little boy is spearheading the attack! Oh, Javi... Oh, dear. <laughs> never would have expected a little kid to whip, out, whip all our lazy, cowardly men into shape. The boy's the only one who knows where the beast's den! Uh, hold on! What about your oranges? Oh no. The men they have banded together. And they're going to kill the beast? Why now? Why when I'm not there? I'm the beast. I'm right here. I'm what you're trying to hunt. The only person at the mansion right now is her. He regretted not he regrets not asking the fruit vendor how long ago the party set off. Though what good would that knowledge have done him? He had to hurry back regardless. The sun was beginning to set, draping the surroundings in deep blackness. As if to keep him from returning home, the knight wrapped its hands around his head, covering both eyes. And in what direction did he have to head to return to the mansion? Holy shit, this music is good! What is the name of the- no, before I go any further, what is the name of this theme so I can listen to it endlessly? 
He stormed through the forest, and eventually the mansion appeared before him, like the world fading into view after a dream. Bestia was a tempest in the night, blowing through the overgrowth toward the house. Please, please make it in time. I... I need her. I need the peace that she provides me. The last thing I want is for her to die. Christ. In the blink of an eye, he was through the door, charging down the, through the mansion's halls. He could not sense anyone else inside, though. All he could hear was the whoosh of the wind blowing into the house from somewhere. It seemed a window was open. Where are you? Where have you gone? Answer me! Please answer me! He cried out the girl's name again and again until his throat was sore and his voice hoarse. But she did not respond. He rushed into a bedchamber. Hey! Hey! Hello? Where are you? Where are you? Answer me! The man swung his head back and forth so hard he thought he might break his own neck, and when he made to look down, he slipped, falling on his tailbone. He felt something stick on his hands, a sensation he would recognize anywhere. The liquid was still warm. No, that cannot be. It can't. It can't. It cannot be. Muttering incomprehensibly in fear, he crawled back through the door of her chamber and into the corridor. Like a genuine beast, he followed the trail of slippery fluid on all fours. The trail glimmered like red wine. It stretched down the hall past the living room, smeared across the floor like it had been wiped down with a mop. Jesus. The man crawled and crawled and crawled until at last he reached the stairs leading to down to the cellar. The ruby trail continued. From beyond the door he could hear men's voices. <sighs> With a howl, this man stumbled down the stairs, throwing open the wooden door. His first impression was that the stench of blood was suffocating, and indeed there he discovered the white-haired girl. He found himself unable to even scream. Her once porcelain skin was no longer even sickly pale. It was now the bloodless color of dirt. She was sprawled haphazardly on the cellar floor. Dried blood stains around her half-open mouth, and those lips were naturally lacking their former rose and sheen. The body was covered with an array of wounds, but the most prominent was the man's singular sword standing tall in her chest. This is the bestia. He doesn't look like the same. It's him. He's the same guy. He's the bestia. Several villagers surrounded him at the behest of a young boy. He's got himself dressed up all proper and fancy, but good clothes don't make him a good man. Isn't that right, you bestia? No. You murderer! Why? Why did you kill her? 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 Why? You wanna know why? Her death was... An accident, I'd say. I feel bad about what happened. But any woman who would live with a man like you must be a witch. Does that hurt? Are you hurting right now, you bestia? Then maybe you are now the mistake. You. You not only stole my parents and friends from me, you ripped the last shot of hope I had from my hands. Do you get it? Do you find me a mistake? How I feel! Now do you know how it feels to have someone you care about taken from you? She, Pauline, was desperately trying to find you. Why? Why would you kill someone so devoted to you? Do you understand what you've done? I'm asking you a question, you goddamn murderer! I see. And now... I have nothing left. What? The man stepped forward, almost perfectly calm. His panic had vanished as if it were never there. His eyes were disturbingly vacant. Perhaps the sorrow had overpowered him, beating his heart into quiet submission. No. No. And that was not the case. And though his eyes were empty, a faint smile spread across his lips. The transition was swift, as though a gear had switched in his mind. The boy and the other villagers were frozen in place at the sight. 
Before long, the man was standing before the deceased girl's body, and then he pulled the blade from her chest. I was... I was really was a beast. And what I wanted was a tether. What? What are you yammering on about? Didn't... Didn't you care about that woman? Didn't you choose her over Pauline? Who you then threw aside and butchered? What... What is wrong with you? What was she to you? She was my... Serenity. But she's dead now. And there's nothing I can do about that. Peace. Calm. Tranquility. <laughs> <laughs> the man's behavior was downright eerie, causing the boy to flinch back. Believing he'd had everything taken from him and could not possibly lose anything more was, I imagine, what had allowed him to stand up to the beast, the source of such crippling fear. Yet now, he found himself unable to move. He found himself in the face of such an incomprehensible creature, paralyzed with fear. And the villagers were similarly dumbstruck. Not even I could understand his behavior. Well, what the... What the hell is wrong with you? How can you laugh at this? D I don't get it! How? How oh, indeed. I wonder, Bryce. <laughs> I don't know either. But you know what? It doesn't matter anymore. Because... Every last one of my anchors has broken off and sunken into the sea. <laughs> Damn it! Get moving! Kill it! I'll slaughter. Every last one of you! Uh, yes. My whole life. I've always... Wanted to kill! Holy shit! What was it that afflicted you with such madness? Losing your memory in the shipwreck? The abuse and insult you suffered at the villagers' hands? Or was it your grief at not being able to return to your homeland? No, and none of those were the root. You were... You were always like this. You always bore those twisted desires. You held those, these deep, constant urges to cause others harm. But that is your essence. The real you hidden beneath the mask of Sorrent's sincerity. The true beast was your heart. The beast was a convenient skin for you to wear. You wanted to be brutal, savage. You wanted to be a brutal, savage murderer. You never really loved the white-haired girl, or the black-haired woman for that matter. You were merely attached to them. Fixated on the idea of a world of tranquility. You use this piece to anchor yourself, to prevent you from drifting off into the ocean of your desires. You yearn to cause pain. While also hungering for the opposite, a calm life. You idolize this idolized life, idealized life, spent in quiet harmony with another because you knew just how difficult it would be for you to attain. Far more difficult for you than satisfying your cravings, but not impossible. I personally had hoped you would find peace with someone rather than descend into savagery. It may have only been superficial, but it would have been very human. But ultimately, peace slipped through your fingers, and no one was left to suppress your desires. You cannot, after all, hold them back yourself. What a tragic man. What a hopeless man you are. Achievement unlocked, Weeping Manor. Wow. Christ. The door to the cellar swung shut. Oh, you had fallen to the floor at some point, unable to bear the stench of blood. The maid stood behind you, her arms wrapped around your shoulders. The maid's voice was chillingly gentle. 
That was quite horrific, wasn't it? Are you feeling unwell, Master? Oh my, you're shaking, Master. Fear not, I assure you, the beast will not come through that door. I am here for you, and I will continue to hold you for as long as you need to settle your nerves. Oh dear, you feel like you might freeze in my arms? Am I really that cold? I cannot tell my own temperature. <laughs> you wish to know what happened to Bestia after that? I could open the door once more and show you. <laughs> but I have no intention of knowingly tossing you back into that den of horrors. He lost the rest of his humanity, becoming holy beast. But... To tell just a little more of the tale, it is my understanding that an entire village was ravaged shortly thereafter. He was a bewitchingly talented swordsman. Not a single person living in that village could stand up to him. And the woman's memories you saw, he was a gentle man, yes? But even the mildest of men can change. And though personally, I believe that while without an element of monstrousness buried deep somewhere deep within, a man cannot become a beast, regardless of what may push him in that direction. And do you follow? <laughs> now tell me, Master, have you remembered anything? Oh dear, I was afraid of that. I'm a remarkably patient maid. I shall accompany you for as long as you require. So do please find your memories. Now let us head to the next door. This mansion is quite large, so hold on to my hand. We would not want to get separated. God. You and the maid traveled down the dimly lit hall, passing by the mirror once again. The light from the candle in the maid's hand was the only thing that reflected in it. The maid herself did not appear. However, just as you were about to avert your eyes, you thought you caught a glimpse of... white hair. Oh. You heard a voice echo in the darkness. And when you turned to face the mirror again, the glass was the color of obsidian, as if it had been painted over. The voice seemed to be coming from beyond the mirror. The maid did not turn back, evidently having not heard anything. You. Oh! Oh, you actually have a choice here. Can I save? Yes, I can. Go unlock it. Uh, let's see what happens if I try to extend my hand. You extended your hand toward the darkness overrunning the mirror. The second your hand brushed against the surface, the tips of your fingers sunk into it. And the next thing you realized, your whole world was sinking into darkness. You could hear a voice. I am the witch. Whoa. Hello. Giselle. It's getting foggy. Looks like it might rain. Maybe we should take a little break. You want to keep going? Oh, alright then. Hmm. This deep in the forest? Thank you very... Thank you very much. You must be tired after have such a long journey. This is the mansion I am looking for, yes? He could have said something. Oh well. I should get going, I guess. Okay. Does no one live here? But if that's the case, then why was I... Such a big door. Please open. It's not locked, I guess. I wonder if the window's open. Darn, not a hint of light. Hello, is anyone there? Please don't tell me it's actually abandoned. I suppose I can't know without looking around a bit more. What do we have here? Drapes? I see a little light beyond... It's so pretty. It looks like an angel. Why would someone cover this up? It's beautiful. With a little more light, it'd be... Please do not touch the drapes. I'm guessing that's the maid. <laughs> All the windows. Whoa! Michael? Michael? Huh? Uh, um, I I'm sorry for coming in uninvited, but um, I did I did announce myself. Is that a? I think that's a guy. 
Is this, um, your mansion? It is. Oh, thank goodness. I was afraid it was deserted. I suspect you would have preferred it if the house were abandoned. Uh, oh, not at all. I would be scared to death staying in this dark mansion all by myself. I I'm sorry. No ill will intended. Uh, but I do think it could do some light. That way you could see where you were walking. And I'm sure this room would look splendid, illuminated. Not necessary. I make, I make do perfectly well as things are. How can you see when it's so dark? I have an abundance of candles and oil for lamps. I am not in want of means of creating light. It is not your place to criticize my lifestyle. If you need light, you are free to leave. If you are in need of money, help yourself to some of the furniture. There's a village not far from here. Trade it for food, then make your way to a larger town. I'm no longer able to freely return to the city. I cannot go back there. Please, don't chase me out. I see. And do you ask this of me aware of how, many, how people refer to this mansion? They say that a witch lives here. Not merely a witch. A cursed witch. If you remain here, you too shall likely suffer your own destruction. You're worried for my well-being? Witch or not, my mind is made up. Which will strike you first, I wonder? Regret or the curse? You seem to be doing this fine. It's only a tale. The witch is real. Very much so. It is not a legend, nor a fairy tale. The witch. The witch's name was Morgana. Ah! No wonder it's called the House of Fatal Morgana. The witch is me. Whoa! Achievement unlocked, Memento. Whoa! What the? What was that? Giselle? Oh my, what is the matter, Master? Why are you just standing in place? There's nothing there. The maid did not seem to have seen anything. You made to ask her you made to ask her about the scene you had just witnessed. <laughs> Master, you look like you've just seen a ghost. What is the matter? How about a little rest before we move on? Do you not wish to remain here? <laughs> Still not fond of mirrors? Ah yes, yes, now let us be off. I, too, dearly wish for you to return to your old self as soon as possible, Master. If your desire is to push forward, onward, then I could hardly be happier. Okay, here's a plot twist. What if the name of this maid is actually Giselle? And I happen to be... Morgana, whatever. Now follow me. You followed the maid's lead, returned to the living room. From there, you climbed a set of stairs, your hand sliding through the dust that had settled on the ebony railing. When you stepped out of sight of the mirror, the maid returned to normal. You had been on the verge of remembering something, but you were no longer in a position to be concerned about such things. For the chill in the air within the mansion seemed to have intensified. Standing at one end of a long corridor, you asked the maid. When was the mansion built? I would imagine you would know more about that than me, master. <laughs> yes, I know. You have not yet regained your memories. I was simply teasing you. I have been a servant of this house for many, many years, but the truth is, I do not know everything about it. All I know is that the mansion is cursed and that it has brought misfortune upon its residents. Since times of old. I can make a conjecture as to when it began, but I believe you should figure it out for yourself, Master. And there's no guarantee my perspective is the correct one. Now, let us proceed. You and the maid Pratt traveled down the dimly lit corridor. While the layout of the house was the same in the eras of the flakes and haired boy and the beast, the bleak, colorless gloom felt incredibly dreary. Okay then. On the wall, part way down the hall, on the wall, part way down the hall, hung a painting. 
The painting, which depicted a beautiful landscape, was oddly entrancing, but you did not have time to appreciate the artwork. Your hand to the mage, you passed by the painting. Before long, a door came into sight at the end of the hall. This door is what I would like to show you next, Master. Listen closely. Do you hear the voices? Lively, but rough, energetic, but coarse. What lies beyond this door is neither a period of elegance and abundance like the first, nor one of ruin and savagery like the second. Technology and culture had become quite developed. Cameras and photography had been invented. It was a time of great progress and many breakthroughs. And for that reason, those who lived in it were constantly seeking to try new things. The tale I'm about to tell you is one of a man who waged everything on his ambitions. I hope that what you see, Master, will stir something in your heart. Now, through the door we go. Please, do not let go of my hand. The maid pushed open the door. Colorful balls bounced around atop a long, dark green table. One man dressed in black and standing by the billiards table turned toward the door. The room was inundated with eye-watering cigarettes, cigar smoke, causing you to squeeze your eyes shut. The Third Door Eighteen sixty nine. My God, we are seriously ju we are seriously jumping several years into the future here. Ooh, gears. That's neat. At that era was a rat race of innovation and development. Ooh, this is some sweet, smooth, jazzy music. The smoke was so thick you could hardly see more than a few feet ahead of you. I could compare it to a dense morning fog, but that might give the impression of beauty, and there was little of that to be found in this haze. Do you see the silhouettes of several men in the smoky room? The one in the middle. The one looking at your direction, Master, was the present master of the house. Oh my god! Okay, we're, we're, we're giving him the Oishi voice because that's freaking Italian, that is freaking gangster right there. His name was Jacopo. 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 Jacopo! Jackie boy! And though he dressed in such fine attire, since I sincerely doubt he understood how splendid the furnishings left in the mansion truly were. I'm a faithful servant to this house, and I would not for the life of me dare speak ill of my master. However, this is a long this is a time long past. I imagined God would be so kind as to turn a blind eye to a little bit of honesty. I was not terribly fond of my master back then. He had wavy hair the color of overdried tea leaves, a piercing gaze, an arrogant smile, and he wore a hat that made him look rather haughty. Yes, he's wearing a fucking fedora. He put his trust only in money, renown, and rank. Oh! Oh, never mind. He gets the Tagami voice. He loved only the iron and steel that had revolutionized so many industries. He had not the slightest bit of love or care for other people. At the very least, that is what I believed at the time. Take a look around the room, master. A jackabo had remodeled it into a recreation area. A billiards table set in the center of the room and the downward facing lights hanging from the ceiling were special made. A light shone upon the dark green stand like a stage, cigars and bourbon lined glass cases installed in place of bookshelves. The cases were always fully stocked, their contents available to partake of readily. At that particular moment, as he had many times before, Jacopo had invited several friends and acquaintances and they were entertaining themselves. His wealthy, high-ranking acquaintances had a variety of hair colors, from polished brass to the brown of a baby robin to the color of sunburn meat. There was also much greater variation in skin tone compared to the visitors and residents of previous eras. But that was hardly any surprise for the mansion set upon land inhabited largely by immigrants of the New World. What's the matter? What are you looking at? Nothing. I just thought I heard someone say my name. Ain't no one there, unless you're seeing a ghost. I don't believe in such nonsense. It's an old ha oh, a different acquaintance. It's an old house with a long history. Wouldn't it be surprising if it had a ghost or two? But the place is gonna be haunted. I'd take a princess over a bloody broad any day. A princess, eh? Hey? <laughs> and when she showed up, you'd have your way with this ghost lady, am I right? Call me impressed, son! You jump her bones and she didn't even got any to jump! Oh, come on now. That's hardly fair. Not much you can even do with a ghost. My god, are you men or children? This is my house and I would rather you didn't talk about it like that. <laughs> Just the blathering of a couple of drunks. Pretend you didn't hear nothing. 
Oh, for the love of God. In any event, whatever happened to that printer you invested in? I haven't heard their name come up in some time. Ugh, can we please avoid that topic? It's been quite the headache for me. I thought it'd pay off, but... It always sounded sketchy to me. I'd recommend you pull out unless you want to find yourself with nothing left but a nice fat pile of debt. <sighs> you could have mentioned that beforehand. Ugh, this is killing me. The men's deep voices resonated in the cloudy room. As they imbibed alcohol and puffed on their cigars, they conversed mostly about business and money. Jack upon and the rest of the men were a breed known as investors. You might also call them tacticians. They survived on information attained before anyone else by making swift decisions and having foresight. Though instead of flesh and bone, their soldiers were made of ink and paper. To an outsider, this meeting might appear to be a congregation of friends, but in reality, they were observing one another, gathering information and anything else they could use to get ahead. At times, money and information were exchanged directly, and when they were no longer of financial value to one another, the relationship would pop like a bubble and dissipate into nothing. Well, you know, Jacopo, you can't be sure this railroad you're so passionate about is going to bear fruit, neither. You don't even know if it'll get finished. And even if they do connect the tracks, will it be really any shape for people to ride? It's a pipe dream, this transcontinental railroad of yours. Jacopo went silent, but I am certain this is what was going through his head. You're a bunch of damned imbeciles if you can't see that the entire country's put their weight behind this endeavor. This is why you have so much trouble making even a few thousand. Oh god, this is going to be jolly good. At the time, a great railway was being built across the breadth of, con of the continent. Construction was spearheaded by two large rail companies in competition for both prestige and a bigger share of this massive national enterprise. The Union Pacific Railroad Company started building from the east and the Central Pacific Railroad Company from the west. But government bonds alone were not enough to finance the mis massive undertaking. By the way, there have even been less than pleasant reports about workers dying on the job for the company you chose, the Central Pacific. Ah, uh, you mean how they're using explosives to blast through the mountains? Making quite a bang they are. But if this gets too much to be much bigger of a fix, they're not going to be able to continue construction. You should at least put your money in the more sure bet of the two, the Union Pacific. It'll cost you to hire replacement workers, and if they keep kicking the bucket, you're gonna have trouble finding more. My goodness. And here I thought you all had spines. You think we're gonna run out of workers just because a few ate it? Huh, there's so many we don't even know what to do with them all. There's not a chance that well will dry up. And if by some chance it does, all we all have to do is scoop up a ship full of blacks or yellows. Oh my god! Man, massively racist! You won't get anywhere if you spend your time worrying about a few measly laborers. This is an endeavor backed by the entire nation. Their deaths are honorable in service of their country. The biggest loss is not of people's lives, but of time. The longer a project takes, the more money it costs and the less profit we make. What we seek is rapid progress, even if the methods to obtain it are messy or oh, deadly. The other and room in the man chuckled uncomfortably at Jacopo's distasteful choice of words. Do you agree with this way of, with his way of thinking, Master? Hell no! Perhaps he does have a point in that great sacrifice is necessary to accomplish great things. Well, yes, but the way he worded it is extremely offensive. And it is true that tragedy often lies in the shadows of the splendor of times long past. Furthermore, the way people see the world changes from time to time, as a, so I hesitate to criticize them too severely. Changed with the times, my apologies. Now, as I'm sure you've already picked up on it, he was an investor who had put money into a railroad company. He also possessed several crude oil refineries, riding on the world's second wave of industrial development. The mansion, too, bustled with life in a way it never had before. It looks like he's a descendant of, um... Bell. Dozens of maids, including me, gardeners, chefs, sculptors, artists. At times we even had writers coming in and out of the house. There was rarely a moment of silence. However, I was not terribly fond of the hustle and bustle, personally. But, pl but please do not get me wrong. I'm hardly opposed to the mansion being cheerful. It was just... Uh, how should I put it? Uh, the splendor of the time seemed... superficial, heartless. It was as though everyone was being rushed along by some unknown invisible force. Part of it was, as I, I expect, caused by the growing divide between those standing at the top and sitting at the bottom. Or perhaps the mansion was simply taken after its master. This, oh god. 
There's no time to waste. Everything is resting upon the success of this project. Whatever it takes, I will ensure it happens. I'd need more money and more power. Suddenly, a restrained knock on the door stopped his train of thought. From beyond the door came a woman's voice, gentle as a soft spring breeze. Pardon me, I have made some tea. May I offer anyone a cup? Oh. Hello, beautiful! When the door opened, in it stood a beautiful woman with pure white hair. It was indeed her. Are you surprised? Or did you anticipate her visit? No, I, 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 I kind of saw it coming, honestly. Though she was not the same age and dressed differently, the white-haired girl, whom we saw fall into the hands of misfortune in the air of roses and the air of the beast, was also present in this era of innovation. Furthermore, she was Jacopo's wife. Whoa! Oh shit, I didn't see that coming. Tea? I don't recall asking for that. When were you asked to make it? I wasn't, but I had these leaves of the most wonderful aroma, and I thought you might enjoy. Shut your trap and know your place! What do you think we have all these maids for? Jesus Christ, dude! D uh, hey now, no need to treat your lady like that. She was just trying to be courteous. These are my personal affairs. Please keep your comments to yourself. His friends were unsure how to react, but ultimately nobody stepped up to stop Jacopo. They merely shrugged, tossing glances at one another. Jacopo stomped over to the white-haired girl. He then grabbed her by the arm and dragged her from the den. Christ! What the hell do you think you're doing? I've told you time and again to stay away from that room unless absolutely necessary. I'm sorry, but um, I made tea and... Shut up about the tea already! You think we're having tea parties in there like a bunch of prissy nobles? D I'm sorry, God! If you really feel so bad, don't go in there in the first place. Get the hell back to your room. I meant no harm. I just, I'm your wife. I just thought it would be nice if I could do something. Like, like I've told you, that's not your job. Don't show yourself in front of the other men. I have nothing else to say to you. My god, you're a dick. Got it? Now scram. Sakes alive. First them, now you? It's driving me up the wall. What is it? I've told you to get out of here. Right, but, um... What? When will you spend time with me next? It has been some time since we last went out together. But we don't even have to go out, just having dinner together with- How many times are you going to make me repeat myself, you worthless tramp? Are those ears only for show? Go back to your goddamn room and uh, Can we summon the beast so he can devour and kill this man, please? Yukimasa, please, time travel, do something, end this arrogant prick! My apologies. GOD! Looking utterly downtrodden, the white-haired girl made a departure. Such a piteous sight she was. As he watched her go, Jacopo merely snorted. Just thinking about the way he behaved then angers me. I have little fondness for men who do, not, who do not treat their spouses with respect. Thank you! I agree with you, nameless maid! Just as you can see, the white-haired girl was in hardly a joyous situation. She was devoted to Jacopo and tried to do whatever she could for him. But he not only brushed her aside, he did so in an insulting, deliberately hurtful manner. They were far from picturesque partners. Do you wonder then, Master, why she married him? The answer to that question will come to light in time. For now, let us follow her. Looking down dejectedly at the drunken tea, the white-haired girl walked alone down the corridor. Though its calming scent filled the air, there was nobody around to have their heart warmed by it. Nor was there anyone to alleviate her loneliness. Despite being the master's wife, the maids who crossed her path in the hills, halls said nearly a word to her. As a matter of fact... Oh dear, I beg your pardon, madam. It's fine. One even bumped into her, stifling a laugh as she trotted off. In all likelihood, she had done it intentionally. The poor white-haired girl who had fallen to the floor stared helplessly at the broken cups. The tea she had made for her husband was forming a stain in the carpet. The maid's behavior toward the mistress of the house was absolutely unacceptable. Nonetheless, it was commonplace. 
all because of the way Jacobo treated her. The more the man of the house acted cruel to her, the less weight her position as his wife held to the servants. Day in and day out, the maids worked busily, offered little opportunity to, for leisure, so they would naturally have accumulated quite a bit of stress, and she had become a target for them to let off the steam. Not directly, but through a more subdued kind of harassment from the shadows. She must have felt quite miserable. I imagine she would have been better off as one of the maids. <sighs> On the surface and in front of the others, they showed respect for her as Jacopo's bride, but behind closed doors, they acted very much the opposite. The disparity between the treatment she received her and others, the treatment she was supposed to receive at all times, and the way she was actually treated made the abuse that much worse. And furthermore, as you have seen through the other doors, Master, she was a very reserved young woman. She could neither raise her voice in reprimand nor raise her hand in retaliation. I have to get this cleaned up. She extended her spindly fingers toward the shards of shattered porcelain. <laughs> but even the broken cup seemed to have no concern to spare for her. Its shattered edge cut her fingertip when she was made to pick it when she made to pick it up. A trickle of warm red blood ran across her unearthly white skin. As painful a sight as it was, it had a sort of taboo beauty to it. The blood spilling from her finger showed no signs of slowing down. She clenched her hand into a fist and let out a sigh, and went back to clubbing the shards of porcelain. But when she did... Madam! Madam! What's the matter? Ah, madam, you're bleeding! Hello there! While all the other maids ignored her, one came running over, shouting to the white-haired girl's side. We need to get that cleaned up and bandaged up. Oh, you don't need to pick that up. That's not your job, madam! It's alright, Maria. There's not much to pick up. Yo, know, I'd make a Umineko joke, but your hair is blonde, so... It is not at all all right. And the rest of you, why are you just standing there? Your boss's wife is on her hands and knees, and you're not even lifting a finger to help her. You disgust me. M Maria, it's fine, really. Oh, madam. If you weren't so timid, this wouldn't happen. You're supposed to yell at them, you know? It's all right, really. I'm, uh, it's my fault. Anyway, we should get that finger taken care of. Let's get you back to your room, okay? But uh, the broken cup and the spill. As I said, that's the maid's work. Now come on, let's go. Okay. And the rest of you! Get this mess cleaned up! She roared like the wind in a thunderstorm. The other maid stood there dumbfounded, watching as she and the whitehead girl disappeared down the hall. But they were soon frowning and grumbling to one another. Do you think she can act all high and mighty just because the master is fond of her? Hmm. The woman's name was Maria. She was one of the maids, and she was the one person in the mansion the white-haired girl could think of as an ally. Though her husband paid her no mind and the maids made her life miserable, just one person, Maria, treated her with respect and kindness. And I am sure you can readily imagine just how much of a lifesaver that was for her. I too found myself somewhat relieved that Maria was there for her. Being the servant of this house, I was also one of the maids working there at the time. However, I was unable to involve myself to any greater degree in her fate. This meant that there was little I could do to assist her, even in times of pain and unpleasantness. The best I could do was pray that Maria would continue to lend the white-haired girl her hand. And that does it. Thank you, Maria. You're always such a big help. Oh no, no need to thank me. I'm trying to figure out a good voice for this thing, again, I'm terrible at female voices to begin with. I just did what any good maid should do. No one else is in the room, you know. Oh, right. Then I can drop the act. Man, I can't just get used to oh, talking all stuffy. I'm out there doing my my best, but the head maid's still spouting stuff like, Your manner of speaking is improper for a servant. Every single time we meet. Yeesh, come on, just shove it, would ya? You're a damn creep. <laughs> now, now, you mustn't speak of her like that. Sorry, sorry, slip of the tongue. She just kind of gives me the willies, you know. Speaking of, you dropped the stuffy talk too, madam. Kind of awkward if only one of us is acting casual, you know. This is normal for me. If I attempted to talk like you, I would freeze up out of nervousness. This is my casual. Mmm, fair enough. 
Guess that's what happens when you're raised well. I like it, though. It has a very regal feel about it. I don't think my upbringing is the only factor. Uh, uh, but you know, upbringing is important. Worth a whole lot more money than money, I'd say. I suppose. Thank you, Maria. You're always so compassionate. You betcha. They don't call me the Virgin Mary for nothing. I practically bleed compassion. <laughs> you know, that might be true. You very well could be the reincarnation of the Mother of God. No, 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 no. Y you were supposed to laugh at that. It's just embarrassing if you take it seriously. Alone in the white-haired girl's room, Maria was acting much more friendly and relaxed as they conversed, as opposed to her no-nonsense attitude in the hallway. The two women were, as you can see, quite close. They had crossed over the wall separating master from servant and built a bond of friendship. And at some point, they'd begun to speak frankly with one another when no one else was around. Maria was the only person in the mansion around whom the white-haired girl felt comfortable being open. I imagine she very much enjoyed these moments of conversation. You wish to know who the head maid was? My, my! Are you sure you want to ask me that, master? <laughs> Some questions are better left unasked for your own good. I, I have to say, madam, you have the prettiest fingers. Mine are all rough and dry and nasty. You think so? Mine haven't the slightest bit of muscle. They're about as frail as dead branches. Oh, who needs beefy mitts anyway? D I... I uh, still healthy-looking hands like yours are far more attractive. What? What is it like about these things? Women all over the world dream of having hands like yours. Slender, feminine, and perfectly cared for. I don't know, just looking at them lights a fire in my loins. Oh, okay. <laughs> Makes me want to lick every last one. <laughs> what? Actually, can I lick? Oh my god. Jesus Christ, Maria. Can I run my tongue up and down all ten of those sweet little digits? Come on, can I? What do you say? D d stop that, Maria. Seriously? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm just kidding. Oh, Maria. All right. How those the tea leaves turn out, madam? The ones you imported. All the maids just adore it. They can't get enough of that aroma. I'd, li I'd sure like to get a taste of it. If you uh end up with extra, I think you could spare a sip for me. <laughs> Uh, that was, um, what was in the cups I dropped? What? Really? Well, ain't that a crying shame? And Jaco Jacopo wouldn't have any of it? God! Why does that man have such a stick up his ass? You went through all the trouble of making it for him and... He was busy. No, he's an asshole. It's not his fault. Yes, it is! Busy? You mean playing billiards, drinking bourbon, and puffing a damn cigar? It may look to us like they were just making small talk, but I'm certain their meeting had some importance to their business. Uh, God, abusive relationship right there! It was imprudent of me to try to step into the men's world. Oh my God! That's just not right. I mean, you're his wife. Why shouldn't you be allowed into the room? It doesn't bother me. <sighs> you don't have to pretend. Here's an idea. How would you like to have some of that tea now? We also have some orange marmalade, which you like so much. Add a scoop of that and a tray of cookies and we have the perfect tea time. Uh, you're singing the siren song, madam. Well, you really should be doing that with him. He would not have tea. I suspect he does not like it. I don't want it to go to waste, so... Madam, I know it's none of my business and I had no place at all saying this, but... It's not impossible for a woman to file a divorce these days. You don't have to sit down and take it. Not one bit. You're pretty well-educated and still young. There's hope, even if you do leave him. There are plenty of other men out there. You aren't obligated to stick with that arrogant jerk. He's just very busy right now. There you go again! There was a time when he was kind. Uh, he wasn't like this when we first met. Back then, he was a little awkward, but a kind man. Hmm. Him? A kind man? Yes, believe it or not. There was indeed a time. Say, Maria, would you mind giving me a little bit more of your time? I, I'll make some tea and we can talk. All right. 
If you're telling me about when Jacopo was decent, I'm all ears. Indeed. Oh boy, let us get into this. Printing picture! As I am sure you're aware, parents arranged our marriage. But I emigrated to this country to be married. Before, I lived in a misty island nation. Portraits of my ancestors hung in the house where I lived. I remember as a child wincing in fear at the sight of them staring down at me. My mother and father were constantly telling me to show them respect, as it was their hard work that kept our bloodline alive and well. However, they were fighting an uphill battle to do the same. It would have been clear to anyone reasonable, reasonably perceptive that our house was coming crumbling down. Valuable furniture and paintings were slowly disappeared, and eventually the portraits were gone too. As our house collapsed, so too did my parents' health deteriorate, robbing us of any source of income. And though I was educated, I lacked the skills necessary to obtain work. Just as we were about to run out of money and options, my parents received Jacopo's parents' marriage proposition. Both of our families stood to benefit from the arrangement. I had social status, and he had wealth. We each had what the others lacked. One needs more than money to make it in the world. Without at least a semi-reputable name attached to you, you're liable to get laughed out of most social gatherings. I first met, J met Jacopo here in this country. We didn't even know what the, others, what the other looked like until our wedding day. To be quite honest, I was scared to death at first. I was so nervous. What kind of man would he be? Was I to be wed to some middle-aged stranger? We were not marrying because he had, we had fallen in love like a normal couple. I knew I was in no position to be concerned with such things. But when I thought about our future, I shook with fear. But the man I saw through my veil at the wedding was remarkable. He was young, had strong masculine eyes, and at the time, he too appeared nervous. <laughs> he was shaking as much, no, even more than me. Seeing that the priest gave an impish little smirk when he asked Jacopo if he vowed his eternal love to me, I counted myself among the happy, and I still do. For in that moment, I experienced true love. He wanted to hear about when he was kind to me. Well, after the wedding, we were given a week to ourselves. I suppose you could call it a honeymoon, though we didn't take a trip overseas, or even go very far at all. He looked at me with uncertainty and asked, Where would you like to go? I beg your pardon? That's what this week is for, right? I'll consider granting your request, so tell me where you want to go. I, I, this is all so sudden. <laughs> Nothing. Well, this whole engagement was spur of the moment. Normally we would have planned a trip in advance, but unfortunately our purpose has served so long as we act the part. You must be disappointed that you have to plan your honeymoon as it's happening. No, um... What? Speak clearly. I don't, I don't like it when people don't speak their mind. I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm happy. Even if this is a political marriage. Well, you're quite the positive thinker. Your parents say something to make you think that way? I, um... Well, either way, if you're so glad to be in this arrangement, then hurry up and decide on a destination. Though there's a limit to how far we can go. If you want to take a trip, I'll consider it. What? Is something funny? It just seemed comical to me that our honeymoon has begun and we're only now deciding where we want to go. Not in a bad way, though. I'm glad our parents didn't arrange everything for us. Uh, perhaps you've heard, but I'm quite sensitive to sunlight and not in the best of health. So it'd be rather trying for me to spend a full week out of the house. We couldn't go on a trip, but, um, if it's not too much trouble... Speak up. Could you show me around town? I'm new to this country and unfamiliar with its customs. And I'm rather afraid to go wandering about on my own. Show you around? Yes. Would that be possible? Hmm. On a rare bit of time off, you ask me to show you around town. Is that really the most exciting idea you have? I, I'm sorry. If um, there's something, if there's somewhere you would like to go, I'm fine with that. I will accompany you anywhere. As if I could drag someone who just professed to being sickly all over the country. My God, I've lost all interest in a trip. Hello, what are you doing? Go get ready, now! I beg your pardon? Didn't you want to see the town? Did you... will show me around? You're the one who asked! 
Not like I have any other options, so yeah, I'll show you around. Th th thank you. Don't just stand there, you dullard. Get a move on. That's uh, uh, one moment. Wait for me, please. He's still kind of an asshole. He hurriedly climbed into the carriage he had called for, a look of frustrated displeasure on his face. And then, as if he had forgotten about me until that moment, he returned, grabbed me by the arm, and led me to the carriage. In retrospect, I realized he was not being very gentlemanly. But I was pleased that he was making any attempt to interact with me at all. <sighs> He's still a dick! As the carriage trotted down the streets... Oh. I saw so many new things. I had spent most of my time cooped up inside at home, so it was like stepping into an entirely new world. And to add that to the rapid industrial advancement currently taking place, I saw men shouting back and forth as they smacked newspaper articles with the backs of their hands. I saw corner cafes cr crowded with cigar sniffing men on break for work. It was like the hustle and bustle of a festival, but every festival had its underside. I also saw overworked men looking like they were on the verge of collapse drinking water from a spigot on the side of the road. By way of contrast, I, I wore fine clothing and, and had a carriage at my disposal. I imagine every day was a struggle for them just to remain afloat. Had I not married the man I had, I too might have found myself on the streets in a similar situation. But it was not that relief that spread through my breast at the sight of them. It was pangs of guilt. It felt to me like a life of opulence was wrong. Sinful. It broke my heart to know that I was living so much better than them. Jacopo snorted disapprovingly at me, seemingly reading my mind, and then said, The poor man who envies the rich covets his wealth, and finds the ambition to make the same for himself, and the rich man who pities the poor, thinking it is his duty to give them offerings of philanthropy. To me, the latter is the far more nefarious. Excessive charity will ruin a man, make him come to expect handouts. And then there are those with the wrong idea of pity, who let themselves fall down to the same place, mistakenly believe it will somehow make the poor feel better. What a joke. If you're going to do anything for them, you might as well encourage them to climb upward. Spur on economic growth and the flow of capital. Doesn't that sound like the better option? I say nothing, simply smiling and giving an ambiguous nod. He had a point. My sympathy and guilt meant nothing to people actually experiencing hardship. If feeling guilty of my own fortune, I acted upon that pity in the way he had described, it would accomplish little more than self-satisfaction. He seemed to have seen straight through to my very core. This was a man who had built his own fortune through investment, which I imagine required him to be rather astute. But doesn't a world where everyone is constantly trying to climb higher and higher sound rather exhausting? Yeah. I personally would prefer to be in a position where I could watch, if only from a distance, as others climbed. But obviously, I could not say as much to him. Some time later, the carriage came to a stop in front of a shop. As I looked at the building perplexedly, he gestured to the door with his chin, signaling for me to get out. Lost and confused, I stepped down from the carriage, and before me spread a showcase behind a large glass window. However, lined up in the case were not precious metals or expensive clothing, but machines. At first, I had no idea what kind of devices they were. Have you never had your photo taken before? N no I have had a portrait painted, though. Are these machines for taking photographs? A portrait, eh? Why am I not surprised? D I did not mean to boast. Go on, get in. B please wait! W wait for me! Hmm... The owner came out to greet us with a wide, wide smile as we entered the shop. Well, if it isn't the strangest thing I've seen all day, you bring in a lady and a real looker at that. Where on earth did you catch this pretty little thing? She's my wife. Huh? What? Well, I beg your pardon? I'll be a monkey's uncle. This goes to show you never know what the root cause may fall, not to mention why for some reason my voice keeps changing sporadically. You make it sound like my getting married is some kind of miracle. I always saw you as one to choose money over love, sir. Oh, pardon me. This ain't this isn't an appropriate to me saying in front of your wife. The, um, do you often come to this shop? On occasion, I need some things here from time to time. I see. There you go, smirking again. What's so funny? And we're going to have our photo taken, yes? I'm so nervous and excited I've never had one before. And to have it taken side by side with you. What are you talking about? Pardon? Who said we were getting our pictures taken? And side by side, please. You're sending shivers down my spine. 
but, but, but this is a photography shop. Hey, shopkeep. The product I contacted you about, is it ready? Oh, oh yep, yeah. so, so, so tight, I'll be right out. Huh? You, take a seat. Oh, there's a chair over there. What? I'm going to show you something much more exciting than sitting still and waiting in front of a camera lens. Uh, oh? Just do as I say. D -d -d okay. Okay. I sat down in front of a large mirror, which I presume was normally used to check your appearance before having your picture taken. Sitting before a mirror with someone else present, present was quite nerve-wracking. Out of embarrassment, I dropped my gaze to my knees. But when Jacopo returned, I was entranced by the curious object in his hands. Whoa. What is this? Do you know what persistence of vision is? The human eye does not perceive the world 100% accurately. This is especially true for objects in motion. It remembers images for a short time, so if you put a new image in the same place, your eye perceives it as in motion. Um... See for yourself will be fast. Seeing for yourself will be faster than explaining it. Uh, you see this. You see, you see the slits in the disc. Uh, look through the bottom one into the mirror. Uh, okay. Good, just like that. Uh, bring your head in close. Uh, here goes. Standing behind me, he slid his fingers across the top of the peculiar toy, causing it to spin gracefully. And then. So, what do you see? Uh, they're dancing! A man and a woman are dancing! Sounds like you're not having any trouble seeing it. Are they dancing well? Yes, yes they are. It's the most adorable thing. What? Adorable? That's funny. I asked to have it modeled after a ballroom dance. Um, um, yes, it's, it's a very elegant dance. But you see, they're small like little dwarves, which I thought was kind of cute. And they seem so close, going around and around without ever letting go of each other's hands. This is incredible. Why does it look like they're dancing? They were all lined up in a row a few moments ago. Goodness, I just explained that to you. It's playing a trick on your eyes. What you're seeing is lots of different pictures in a short period of time. To put it in words, you might understand better. It's an illusion. Your eyes are being fooled into thinking the image is moving. An illusion? But they're dancing. They really are. And look, they're having a wonderful time. Are you sure it's an illusion and not something else? To me, it does not seem to be. I cannot see it as anything but two tiny people dancing. That's how it works. Uh, reach out your hand and try to grab them. You won't be able to. Ah, you're right. That's a shame. I didn't think you actually would. But it's the most precious thing. <laughs> Look as though they're dancing on top of my palm. I was mesmerized by the strange phenomenon. Pictures were moving after all. Still images had begun dancing before me. It was almost as if God had breathed life into them. He had called it an illusion, but I could not grasp that. It was such an adorable, heartwarming sight. I imagined the two were off living in some other world, separate from her own. They looked so happy. I was almost certain that they were off dancing in their joyous world, free from all the sorrow and loneliness and pain of this one. Eventually, the speed at which they, began to s they danced began to slow, as if they were resting their legs. I almost thought I could hear the sound of their feet with each step. Ah, they've stopped. They can dance forever. They don't get tired. I see. I'm amazed such an incredible device exists in this world. It makes me wish I had gone outside sooner. I'm sure someone from as distinguished a house as yours has seen plenty of amazing things with your family. Hardly. I rarely ever left the house. I'm ignorant about the ways of the world. If you had not told me, I would have probably never known about moving pictures. The illusion of moving pictures. Do you like it? Yes, of course. More than the portrait you had painted? Yes. Yes, I do. The painting was wonderful, too, but... You can't seem to make up your mind. Go on. Tell me. Which do you like better, the portrait or this? Uh, um... I like this better. I see. He looks somewhat pleased. Hmm, though when it comes down to it, this is a simple trick only a child would fall for. Then I suppose that makes me a child. If it means I get to go watch something as splendid as two tiny people dancing, I'll happily fall for the trick. 
quite describing it as quite describing it as two tiny people dancing. You're going to lose your head that far up in the clouds. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I do not know how else to describe it, though. It's a toy called a... Phanakistoscope. The... Phanakistoscope. Phanakistoscope. Phanakistoscope? Phanakistoscope. Fuck! <laughs> Damn it! Phanakist... Wheel. Close enough. <laughs> it was invented around 30 years ago. I had the shopkeep make one modeled after the original design. So the shop owner do this? He did. A lot better than you'd expect, isn't he? Yes, indeed. I'm surprised he could draw something so cute. Say that to his face and he'll go red as a beet. What I'd give to get a load of that. You should tell him the next time you see him. <laughs> He's a sweet man. Despite how he looks, you mean? It's not right to judge people based on their appearance. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't take it too seriously. The shopkeep here loves new technology. That Fanakistoscope is one such invention that caught his eye. You can trick the eye to thinking drawings are moving. Using a sequence of photos, you can perhaps make it as theme seem as though real people are moving too. And if it becomes possible to show these images to many people at once, these developments could broaden the options artists have to express themselves. Not drawings, but photographs? Yes, photos. By taking hundreds or even perhaps thousands of photographs, it would be possible to reproduce the world as we see it. This room. People walking down the streets. There's no point in recording boring everyday life, though. If you're going to leave a record of anything behind, it should be the projects and enterprises that moves nations. Say, for example, a moving record of the opening ceremony of the railroad. That would be something worth watching. And then in time, it would expand beyond a mere record keeping technology and find its way into the hands of artists. Ugh. Is such a thing possible? You must remain still for a long time just to take a single photograph. Right now, it isn't. But eventually, it will be. And I'm not simply fantasizing here. Is that so? Sounds so very futuristic. Do you... What? Do you want to support people who work on that sort of thing? Is that why you are friends with the owner? It has nothing to do with my wants. I merely think there's money in it. The rich stall for entertainment and artists create their entertainment. I have no interest in their pretentious self-expression. I just want their money. <laughs> what? What's so funny? You look like you're enjoying yourself. Honestly, it's just about the money. As you say. Huh. Alright, let's get moving. Next is dinner. What? We're leaving already? Does that displease you? N no not at all. To tell you the truth, I wanted to spend a little more time playing with the Fenicus wheel, but I could not bring myself to say as much. Reluctantly, I approached the owner to return the wheel. I don't bother. Bring it with you. What? But... If you don't want it, that's fine too. Just make your decision quickly. You're making the driver wait. Having said that, Jacopo exited the shop. I alternated between looking at his back and the Finicus wheel, debating what I wanted to do. And then with a smile, the owner whispered to me. You're allowed to keep it, really. Your husband out there had it made as a gift for you. For me? A little while back, he came to my shop asking if I could make a Finac... Fin <laughs> God damn it! <sighs> my mortal enemy. Now that about knocked me out of my chair. He's a man who almost never asks for favors. He's pretty damn brusque and he's got a tongue sharp enough to cut steel, but he's not wicked to his core, I swear it. So please, ma'am, be a pillar of support for him. Okay, what the hell? I'm guessing money really fucked up his personality because he seems like a total dick. I mean, he kind of seems like a dick right now, but at least he was kind of nice. In that moment, the Fenicus wheel became a precious treasure to me. We had only just married days earlier, and yet he had commissioned it for me without even knowing what I looked like. I was filled with a warm, pleasant elation. I agreed with the owner. Jacopo was not a bad man. He merely had difficulty expressing himself. Hurrying back to the carriage, I gave him my deepest thanks. He glanced over at me for a moment, and then turned back toward the window and muttered, Yeah. From there, we went to a restaurant for dinner. 
You call this a pizza? The crust is an atrocity. It's like I'm chewing on rubber. How can you wave my country's flag and not serve spaghetti? Do you have any shame at all? This wine is pitifully unbalanced, far too high levels of acidity. Listen to me carefully. The house wine is the face of a restaurant. He complained about every little thing. It was a complete disaster. But curiously enough, I was not at all put off by his behavior. When the sun set, the carriage made its way to a nearby hill. The cool nighttime breeze felt wonderful on my skin, flush from the alcohol and the light from the gas lamps had comforting warmth to it. Though Jacopo had complained about the quality of the wine, once he had intoxicated himself, his mood inc improved visibly. It made him unexpectedly talkative. Look out at the city. A gloomy town that shuts down at night isn't suited to expansion or growth, but the city isn't like that. You can see people walking beneath the lamps, and you can hear the bustle of them talking. This is a city that still has plenty of room to grow. As they ride the rising wave of the economy, many, many more people will gather here. More people means more money in circulation. More money in circulation means the city grows, companies are founded, and more goods are bought and sold. Will it really change so drastically? It can be difficult to see what's happening from the inside. The majority of people just go about their daily lives, and the next thing they know, things are different. No, I'd wager most don't notice the changes at all. Only those with eyes sharp enough to realize what's happening can see success. I cannot afford to overlook even the most minute change. Do you have a dream of some kind? A dream? I'm not sure if it's easy to... enough to obtain to call a dream. Others might call it greed or perhaps ambition. I don't laugh now. My intention is to make the world mine. The world? Yes, the world. <clears throat> and to do that, you need either physical strength or kindness, but money and influence. People have no choice but to kneel before those forces. Why are you so intent on obtaining power? Because... I want to change my country, I imagine. Your country? You are aware that I, like you, am an immigrant, right? I immigrate from an island in the Mediterranean, though not the same island as you. My country is a peculiar place where candor and violence go hand in hand. As a whole, the country is on a poor side, and if nobody does anything about that, I am one of but a few of my fellow countrymen who have set his sights on the New World. They are falling far behind other nations. If I find success here, perhaps that will catch their attention. But if it doesn't, then my country is doomed to collapse. You have much love for your homeland. My feelings are... a little more complicated than mere love. But that's nothing you need to concern yourself with. Well, I'll have to remember not to get myself drunk around a woman again. Forget everything I just said. It's about time we head back to the house. Alright, but um... What is it? Is it alright if I provide you encouragement as you try to attain your dream? I know my presence is more likely to be a hindrance, but I would like to be there to watch as you trek forward. I suppose, and do as you wish. Thank you. You have my support, then. Um, d d darling <laughs> Sent a shiver down my spine, though not an unpleasant one. I'm glad to have you as my partner. This is a dramatically different Jacopo. Okay, maybe not dramatically, but... I was without a doubt happy then. His smile, the things he said, the finicus wheel he gave me, they were all undeniably real. And those memories gave me the will to wait. For the day things go back to the way they were. They allow me to believe. But what the hell? What the actual fuck was that? But that is where I'm going to have to end it. Uh, save? Oh boy, ghost story! Great! I get to do ghost story next recording! Ah! Okay. First off, finished Yaki Yuki Masa's tale. Holy shit! To be honest, his reaction is, well, I kind of saw that coming. Uh, second, whoever the hell the witch Morgana is, or my, Mi Michael, Michael, Michelle, I, I, I think it's a guy, I don't know. And now we got asshole Jacopo. Okay, first off, what made him, ch I mean, I'm guessing money had to have made him change this to be this, you know, much of a dick. 
Because that was just freaking abuse, what he did earlier. That is just fucking abuse. I don't know. But I'm sure we'll find out. I'm not entirely sure when, but I'm sure we'll find out. Also, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Will ignoring that, the, um, the choice up here to the next door, will averting the gaze just kind of not really affect the outcome of the story or not? I'm just going to ask that right now. Will that affect the outcome of the story? Or does it offer anything different or new? Obviously not spoiling anything, but does it like does it have any major plot changes if it does or not? But anyway, that's what I'm going to end it. So if you guys like this, be sure to let me know. Oh god, this is so good! I freaking love this. I'm also having way too much fun messing around with my voice a little too much. I didn't expect there to be a we I did not expect <laughs> to have a freaking conversation or a weird business conversation having Tagami, Hideyoshi, and Oishi. Could you imagine a could, could you imagine a com, a, a freaking business discussion between those three though? <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm gonna. So if you guys like so thank you guys so much for watching and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. I'm never gonna stop thinking about that possibility. <laughs>